Sweden, with its serene countryside, its sense of order, and air of quiet confidence, is also one of the 21st century's most adventurous trading nations, with a commercial influence that reaches far beyond its population of 9 million. For all the nations in all the world, I don't think any other country's shopping or retail scene so closely mirrors both its political and social system. The Swedes like to talk about this thing called Jantelag and this idea that no Swede is above any other, that they're all equal. Globally, two big brands emerged out of this country, both H&M and IKEA, and their design philosophy, the way they're managed, I think even the way those companies are even socialized, very much mirrors that system. If you stack them up against all other retailers, though, both those companies are anything but in the middle. Sweden's not just a nice place to visit. It plays a unique role on the world retail stage, having turned small walk-on parts in fashion and self-assembly furniture into attention-grabbing global starring roles. God should really bless the Swedes because not only do they abide by the Jentelagen code, but they also pay some of the highest taxes in the world. So while many would love to wear other brands or sit on different chairs, it has to be said they can't really afford anything other than IKEA's and H&M's latest offers. Trend analyst Kai Bond believes this also affects their behavior towards one another. We have values that no one is better than another one. That's Luther. That's, uh, I mean, that's our history, okay? And that is, I mean, so profound that it's laughable, really. <laughs> but it never goes away. It's, it's, there is, I mean, it's not really considered an achievement to make money, for instance. Uh, because then, then, then it comes, then the envy comes, you know. Oh, he thinks that he's better than me because he has more money. Uh, you know, reasons like that is not politically correct in this country. I'm quite sure we could follow any one of these Stockholmers back to their tidy little flats and we'd find H&M knickers, denim and shirts in the wardrobe and also find that the wardrobe's name is Quadrat and comes from Ikea. The Swedish consumer in our society is quite spoiled because we are taken care of. You have a certain salary, you have a certain standard and you can also be helped by the government. And that uh, gives the Swedish consumer a special, how do you say, a special way to look upon consuming. Uh, I think that the Swedish consumer really believes that what's make, what makes the site go around is the consuming. And how they consume has always been driven by lifestyle. The Swedish desire for living in well-kept, functionally designed small urban spaces also made them hungry consumers of furniture that reflected simple, modern architecture. There are few neighborhoods which say quite so much about this country than this particular modernist patch of Stockholm. Built in the 1930s, Järdet is not only a perfectly preserved neighborhood of funkus houses, it was also an experiment in modern living which cuts to the core of what this country of 9 million people is all about. Ruled for the better part of six decades by social democratic governments, Sweden has been a living laboratory for myriad socialist experiments. Everything from urban planning to education to childcare has been given a uniquely Swedish touch and many of the country's policies have been both admired and derided by the rest of the world. What does Sweden mean to you? The highest standard of living in the world? Free love and suicide, drunkenness and abortion, the lovely clear-cut women, blonde and statuesque. For me, Sweden's all this, and especially design. Few ugly things are made by the Swedes, and not just the design of pots and pans, of furniture and fabrics, but of homes. This has been called the city of the future. 
It'll be heated, lit and powered by atomic energy. In fact, it has its own nuclear reactor. I don't think that we really had the possibilities to realize that dream of a better life or a better housing or a better kitchen until the late 50s and early 60s. And we had an enormous lack of housing at that time. So uh, overwhelmed by the possibilities to change, we started to tear down all the old uh, centers. Of course now, if you look in with the retrospective, it was stupid, it was uh, maybe even a catastrophe, we lost a lot. But at the time, I think people saw possibilities of a brighter future, more bringing light uh, into the city centers of, of Swedish smaller towns. The Swedes are convinced that the old system of distribution with small shops scattered across a residential district is out of date and that today's busy housewife needs one-stop shopping. No one goes without central heating. Good design is cheap and commonplace, even tedious. There's a small price to pay, of course, a tightening of the strings which control life, an ordered antiseptic atmosphere, little common hilarity. You're enveloped by a strict code of formal behavior, by a polite control. The Swedes may be a shade too rational for this tricky world. They believe that every human need can be met by sensible organization. from Saab to Ericsson, from Volvo to Roxette. Okay, well, perhaps they're not all that likable, but Sweden punches well above its weight and regularly tops polls of most admired countries. And if you had to jot down a top five list of brand values that best represent Sweden, you'd probably come up with traits like pure, clean, peaceful, outdoorsy, and generous. But what about words like aggressive, efficient, innovative, and revolutionary? If you'd be surprised if you look at how many of the major industrial uh, innovations made in the, in the 20th century originate from Sweden. Everything from dynamite to ball bearings, everything like this. There's really fundamental stuff in industry. But the Sweden that has created monster global brands has peddled away hard against its history as a heavy industrial nation. You must remember that a big difference between Sweden and, and England and, and major continental European nations is that, that Sweden is not an old civiliza civilization. I mean, just a hundred years ago it was still a purely agrarian country, very poor and everything, and uh, then came an uh, industrial revolution in this country where it turned from being a very backwards country into being one of the most modern and sophisticated nations in the world over a period of, of, of just 50 years. We have, in a way, a much simpler society than, than the old civilizations on the continent. The Swedish experiment in retail has also been helped by the country's remote geography. When you're not at the center of it all, like a London, New York, or Paris, you have to work that little bit harder to make an impact. I also think all those long winter nights force people to read more, analyze existing business models, and come up with more creative ideas than people who live in more agreeable climates. Take, for instance, IKEA, founded in a very small town in the south of Sweden. It takes a good five hours to get from Stockholm to IKEA's headquarters here in Elmholt. In fact, I should probably call it its birthplace because it's rather tricky to pinpoint where the company's headquartered. It's got divisions in Switzerland, the Netherlands, Denmark, and according to a friend of mine who once worked at the company, it's perhaps one of the least transparent companies of scale. But then again, it can be because it's private. On Global Rich Lists, IKEA founder Ingvar Kamprad frequently ranks top five as one of the world's richest men. The reclusive Swede, now living in Switzerland, started IKEA at the age of 17 in a small garden shed, selling ballpoint pens. Driven by profit, but guided by principle, Kamprad championed his motto, a better life for many people, with evangelical fervor. Now, 60 years on, his flat pack concept stores are found in 33 countries around the world. If you ever wondered what would happen if IKEA actually took over the world, well, this is what it would look like because Elmholt is Ikea town, with Ikea Street, even its own Ikea museum.
Elmhold is not only the spiritual home of IKEA, it's also the hub of its product development and of a massive studio and production space where those familiar room sets are created. It's probably the biggest photo studio in Europe, perhaps even the world. We, we produce around 2,000 room sets per year in this studio. How much is core? I mean, how much would I see replicated in the Kuwait American Singapore edition? Uh, and then how much is done completely fresh for each catalog? Every picture that is used in the catalog uh, for the next year is, is sort of uh, fresh. And then you can say that there is uh, a number of exchange pages for each country that has a different range or, or um, North America has a different kitchen range, for instance. But basically you can say that 80-90% goes all over the world. We have a, a quite restrictive uh, way of, of uh, knowing about certain cultures, especially when we come to, to countries in the Far East, in the Middle East, where religion plays an important role. We have some absolutely sort of no-nos, things that we just absolutely can't do. So we have a very, very clear production plan. When we're shooting this picture, this bed, it's probably three or four versions of that bed. Does there always have to be a component of Swedishness in, in everything you do, whether it's 1% or 50%? Absolutely. I, mean, I think that the roots are, are playing an important role in what we do. We have, uh, we have a point of view, and, and that very much reflects uh, a Swedish or a Scandinavian way of living. I think that the, the, the focus on the family, the focus on the kids, the way we treat sort of the kids, the way we let the kids be a part of the everyday, um, the way we look upon um, that the, the home is not sort of an exhibition hall, it's somewhere where you live, it's somewhere where you bring friends in, it's, it's, um, it should be a place for everyone. I think that that is uh, it's very, very Swedish, very Swedish. That same philosophy of providing affordable, accessible merchandise has also propelled H&M from the Swedish high street into the global marketplace with over a thousand stores in 21 countries. Their strategy of taking elitism out of fashion by hiring star designers like Karl Lagerfeld and Stella McCartney to design for the masses has further fueled their cult status and caused headline-grabbing mini retail riots when the clothes hit the stores. Last year, their pre-tax profits rose to 260 million pounds, a vast 34% up on the previous year. The business idea is fashion and quality at the best price. We like to think that design and good fashion should be available for everybody, regardless of how much money you have or where you live. H&M's legendary White Room, a restricted access area at their Stockholm headquarters, is at the heart of their attitude to design. It's a vast resource of material and inspiration available to their 100-strong design team, which is led by Margareta Vandenbosch. In spite of the complexity of the operation, she puts the company's global success down to a very simple underlying philosophy. I think that clothes should be practical, that you must be able to wash them and, and uh, kind of um, easy to, to wear and easy to handle. I think these kind of practical things can be quite Swedish. We look at our, what we are selling and we think why and we think about the customer and we create different concepts for them and then we also have to offer them new things all the time and we want things to happen in the stores all the time so people come in and see, see new things. IKEA's and also H&M's uh, philosophy is very much like the Swedish national soul. It's kind of complex to describe, but, but it is it's very deep in both those cultures that, that er everybody deserves to have fashion, everybody deserves to have interiors, and therefore it should be very cheap so everybody can afford it. And that is also why in Sweden you find every girl, every boy look the same because they just they, they go out and buy the, the, the latest things from the chains and people are not bothered by that. On the contrary, in many other countries you want to be different, but, but the Swedes, they really like to be like their neighbor, you know. They, they, they <laughs> it's almost scary in, in Sweden sometimes, you know. It's a very collective ideal that we have here. 
The glue that has held together this collective ideal of smart and affordable for so long may now be coming unstuck as the realities of global economics bite. They do it so well what they do. They have the best possible sort of uh, fashion for the best possible low price. Then, of course, if you, uh, if you analyze this, you can find question marks because, because um, is that really what we need? Do we need to shop low price products? It's not, I mean, about H&M especially. It's about everything. Do we need low price products? Now, I would say generally, no, because it's not the shopping that make our lives. It's not the shopping or frequent shopping, I would say, that um, fulfill a society. Because instead of giving a society good jobs or giving them jobs, we take away the jobs. And we let other producers in other countries produce for us. So, no, I don't think that is generally very good. What is it that gives these two companies the edge internationally? While design is at the core of their philosophy, I would argue that they're logistics companies as much as purveyors of lifestyle. After all, it's all about getting it to market first. <laughs> Aside from the fact that both companies obviously are watching their bottom line and, and certainly their, their outgoings in terms of expenditure, are there other things with, within the makeup of these businesses that also make them very unique? Or when you get to Amhult or when you get to the Stockholm headquarters, are they very different businesses? Uh, they are both fairly, still fairly unbureaucratic. Uh, they both allow talented people to uh, make a career fairly fast. Uh, they're not upheld by bureaucracy or by uh, hierarchy that could hinder the development of, of uh, personal initiatives. In a sense, they are very simple companies. I think that's extremely important. With little room for homegrown premium brands and a culture where consumers shop almost exclusively on price, where does that leave all those clever young souls who power the creative component of this country's economy? Do they all have to one day worship at the altars of H&M and Ikea? Matthew, being a, both a lecturer and also an industrial designer yourself, what impact do you think these mega brands like H&M and Ikea have on the future of design in this country, meaning the students? I think they have a huge impact. I mean, especially in that sense that they are sort of setting up the agenda or being the, the manual f for the consumer uh, for what is contemporary design somehow. Uh, even though you as a designer don't think of it as being contemporary, you want to be somewhere else, you want to be many steps in front of them, then still they are um, uh, to the public the ones that, that is uh, telling you what is contemporary. So I, I think in that sense they have a huge uh, influence on, on what is coming out uh, from this school and from the students' work also. How would you define Swedish design? Uh, what do you think sits at the foundation? Low tech, I think, is the, the, the main word for Swedish design traditionally and also today, I think that... Does so low tech mean simplicity or...? Yeah, or simplicity in a constructive way, I think. I mean, it's very rare that a Swedish design product has some kind of deeper thought than being good for the purpose it, it, it expresses. I mean, a chair is a chair and it's based on four legs and it has a backrest and a seat and that's, that's it. What type of power does a brand like IKEA hold over young industrial designers in this country? A lot, little, doesn't matter? Of course, they have the power to provide lots of people with, with design. And um, that's a good thing. And um, they, what they do is that they keep their prices low. And uh, if they can get design for a cheap price, why pay more? That's a good thing to have in mind when you're designing stuff. You can do very good products and they don't have to cost a fortune.
It's hard to compete. Like you just have to, in that sense, maybe if you want to do your own thing, you just have to take a step away from it and try to spe make be specific in your area. Like in making either maybe really high quality or whatever is your specific thing. I guess since they're covering so much and they're also so cheap, so you have to contribute with something else. Will this country and many other European countries only be dominated by? companies which have great design and great prices? Uh, or do you think Sweden might shift and you might see you know, a renaissance of, of small design again? Uh, where does it go? I hope it goes in that direction that we, need, um, that we can see small designers more in the future. Unfortunately, it's really hard to survive as a small designer. And a lot of things have actually happened in Sweden in the last years. Um, we have great um, independent designers coming up. But unfortunately, they go dead in a couple of years because it's so hard to survive. I've been pushed around and I'm not gonna get pushed this time. But Sweden is very good at exporting stuff, and the Swedish penchant for control freakery hasn't stopped them being exceptional at creative exports in particular. Bands like the Shout Out Louds have already made it internationally, making Sweden the third largest music exporting nation in the world, after the United States and the UK. Some young Swedes are creating successful new premium labels of their own. The Stockholm-based design group Acne made their name building brands for a clientele that spans entertainment and technology. They also make quirky ads for big global players. We are a very driven design group, and for us it's always the next step or the next thing, or I think we are a little bit uncommercial in that way. We can never really transform into a company like IKEA or H&M. But they have already moved into fashion and launched ready-to-wear and denim lines. Using their unique philosophy, they bring skills in advertising, design and brand management to their own products. We want to be perceived as something that is a little bit more intellectual. It's, it's, of course, functional as we are in Sweden. I want the customer to feel when they, when they buy our stuff that they, they can have it for a longer term. It's really a challenge to make something for a person to have it for a longer term. We're a concept that it's all about design, form, music and fashion, and it transforms the whole time. So we're not going to make like one thing and then stick to that. So what's on Sweden's retail horizon? Is there an interest amongst young creatives to create a new global contender, a new brand that becomes an adjective? The people growing up today are used to, like, like really used to very, very high standard of living. And I'm talking about also not only the upper classes and or the middle classes, but even our, our, our lower classes are, are used to having a very high standard of living, a high material standard, a lot of things. And, and that makes for, uh, they, they, they want things to come very easy now. And, and uh, you can still see people working very hard in this country, but I think, uh, the, the youngsters, they want things quick now, and, uh, and, and, I, and I, I don't think that that in the long run is good for entrepreneurship. According to what you've told us, Joran, that H&M and Ikea have managed to succeed because they've operated in their natural groove. They've operated in a sort of a very democratic environment. They've operated largely in the middle. Could this country give birth to a super premium luxury goods company? Uh, or does the next thing just have to be then a democratic grocery store? What happens next? I, I think we could never give birth to a, a Gucci. It's not in our genes. We've been talking a lot about the post-war, post-Second World War period. But if you uh, want to talk about the simplicity of Scandinavian or Swedish design, you have to go further back. You have to go back to the 18th or even the 17th century, where the lack of resources governed everything we did. That is our sort of, that, that is what gave birth to the simplicity. We could, you could never dream of Sweden inventing Baroque or something like that. It's not in our genes. Is the future, and maybe Sweden is pointing in a certain direction, that everything will be vertically integrated and we're not going to have this mix. Everything is going to be the mono brand. Is that where things are going? I'm absolutely sure that is going to change. 
same thing that you see in, in, in food or in, in uh, hospitality. You have a trend and then there, it's a trend for a while and then the trend changes. I'm sure that we're going to see in say in 10 years we have another uh, superstore in Sweden with a mix which I think will be the really interesting thing in, in the future. Few things from many places instead of many things from one place. You have to come up with something else uh, worthwhile because there is again this value for money, this um, question of environment, a uh, question of fulfillment, well-being. I mean those are big questions that will change the consumer society. I mean, we have to, I think that we are in the middle of a cleaning of society, of the market, I would say, more than anything else. Because there are so many shops, so many products that we really don't need. And uh, in order to be able to work or to do something that we are good at all over the world, we need to reflect and to think about what do we really need. All the same, Sweden's domination of the high street doesn't show any signs of slowing down. It may well just be speeding up. After all, Swedish style has been adopted by most of the modern world as its style of choice. What do you think it is within this country of nine million people that has allowed you to develop this extraordinary company? It's a lot of different things, but I think our, our, um, our stubbornness, um, our very sort of true beliefs in, in what we do and holding on to something um, is also quite Swedish. But I think that the, the core inspiration that we seek for is how is people living their lives and how would they improve their lives. It's easy to love what we do. While there's something exciting about powerful brands that hail from a mild-mannered, unassuming nation, there's also something quite scary about them because in their homeland, they've all but crushed a culture of small shopkeepers. Super retailers are starting to have a similar impact elsewhere with more cities looking eerily alike because they all have the same collection of mega brands. Ultimately, if it is lifestyle that informs the retail sector, it may well be that the next big idea to change the world's living rooms and wardrobes will come from Sweden. Well, that's all from Sweden. I'm off to Italy now to look at one of the last countries in Europe where small business is part of everyday life and craft and provenance still count for something. Oscar-nominated Storyville tonight on BBC4, charting the destruction of native marine life in Lake Victoria since the introduction of the murderous, cannibalistic Nile perch in the 1960s. Darwin's Nightmare at 10. Stay with us now for The World, next. <laughs>